Muy buenas noches, bienvenidos a la serie internacional de Tiempo de Mercadeo 2013. Yo soy Carlos Fernando Villa. GoProsper es una de las empresas más famosas de consultoría de mercadeo internacional que tiene sede en la ciudad de Columbus, en el estado de Ohio. Roger Saunders es uno de sus directivos, un hombre que conoce muchísimo sobre el mercado asiático y específicamente con la China y el efecto que han tenido los tratados de libre comercio, como decíamos antes. Por eso vamos a hablar con él sobre un mercadeo efectivo cuando hay tratados de libre comercio. Vamos a hacerlo en unos minutos cuando regresemos de comerciales. Ya volvemos. Roger, good evening and welcome to my program. Thank you very much, Carlos, for having me. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, Roger, let me ask you or let me start by asking you what's a competitive advantage uh, i mean a competitive intelligence competitive intelligence is an opportunity to be able to understand your marketplace it really comes back to core marketing uh, principles of understanding the consumer first what it is that you're trying to accomplish what products or services that you're trying to bring to them uh, at what particular price how often are they going to consume it and understand Uh, how that measures up compared to your competitor. We all have competitors, whether we're in the CPG business or whether we're in the automotive business or whether we're in, in the retail business. And the consumer has choice. Uh, more and more all around the world, we're finding that companies are recognizing the consumers at the center of the equation. So you have to start with that, uh, that center portion. Uh, you reminded me of Peter Drucker in 1950s mm -hmm. because too many companies in the world don't recognize what their competition, the competi competitors are. Mm -hmm. And he used to say in the 50s that the, 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 the competition or the competitors that we're going to have are direct competitors, indirect competitors, mm -hmm. and invisible competitors. Mm -hmm. And when he said invisible competitors, he was, you know, he was uh, referring to the web, to the internet. Mm -hmm. You don't see your competition, but you have it. Right, right. And as you recall, Ted Levitt in the Marketing Myopia said that one of the big problems for marketers is to identify the competitors. And I would like your opinion about that. Well, first of all, I'm a big fan of Drucker, and I uh, read him uh, very actively for a, for a number of years. Who uh, isn't? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the marketing business, you have to, uh, oh, you yeah. have to follow, follow the individual. Uh, he had an ability to uh, say that we have incomplete information about all of the battles that we're going to fight. We don't know all of the information there is to know about pricing challenges. We don't know all of the information there is to know about distribution patterns that have to take place. We don't know all the information about competitors are going to come up with a brand new product that's going to be better than ours. Uh, so you still have to be able to make your marketing decisions in an incomplete sense. And that takes uh, courage and, and a boldness on the part of uh, organizations and the people that, uh, that are leading it. Um, that's never going to change because somebody's always going to be coming along and building a better product, offering a new service. Uh, and that creates new jobs and new opportunities for economies all around the world uh, who are going to adapt to those, uh, to those changes. Uh, talking about Peter Drucker, I remember once I talked to him in, you know, his last years in L.A. And uh, he didn't want to do the program with me because he was too old. And he said, no, I don't want to do the program because I, I can't talk the way I used to. And he said, mm, talking about marketing and things like that, he said to me, there is one thing that I know m most than anything else, and that's that I don't know. And that's why you have to keep asking people about everything. <laughs> that's very, you know, very, very wise for him to say right. that. That was very wise for him to say that. I would agree with you. Yeah, because the, the only thing that we know is that we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And not to take anything away from Peter Drucker, uh, he was right, but he was beat by a couple thousand years because it was actually Aristotle yes. who said, the only thing that I do know is that I know nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he repeated that to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, you were just saying, uh, talking about competitive intelligence, that you should know, you have to know, um, from the marketing standpoint, who your customer is, 
what they want, what they need, who your competitors are, and things like that. How can you know everything? I mean, how can you know that? Again, you can't completely know everything. There's an enormous amount of uh, what the world is going through right now. Uh, people are calling it big data. Uh, there's lots of data and information that's out there, and more and more is being developed uh, every single day. <laughs> Let me interrupt you. What's the difference between data and information? Is there any difference? There is uh, a difference. Information is a more refined portion of the data. Uh, we have data that leads to information uh, and then into insights. And what companies are looking for is the opportunity to have an insight into how that consumer is going to behave. But it all starts, the connective tissue, if you will, is the data that comes through the pipeline. Uh, an example, let's say credit cards. We know how often an, a consumer might use their credit card. That's a data that, stream. Yeah, okay. uh, the information is how did they use? Why did they use? Right? Why did they use? How much did they spend on that particular item? What types of items did they buy via their credit cards? Roger, we're going to go to a commercial break and we'll be right back, okay? Okay. Vamos a ir entonces a una tanda de comerciales y ya estamos de nuevo con ustedes. Going with uh, what you were saying, because I interrupted you to ask you about data and, and information. So uh, let's keep talking about that. Okay. Well, as you know, uh, our company, Prosper Business Development, uh, is really a series of companies. We have companies here in the United States, uh, Prosper Analytics, uh, Insights and Analytics, Prosper Technologies, but we also have an operation in China uh, called Prosper China. Uh, and we've been working in China since 1996. Uh, back at that particular point in time, we recognized that China was going to uh, continue to grow and evolve. Um, and, and if I could give you a, a macro uh, economic uh, type of view of why we thought that way. Okay, I would like to. We, economies can only grow four ways when you really get down to it. They, they grow by uh, investments that uh, companies make in terms of building a new plant, building a new store, etc. They grow by infrastructure. And infrastructure largely comes from, uh, from government uh, uh, oriented types of things. We're building new airports, yes. we're building new railroad stations, new roads, uh, uh, schools, etc. Uh, it grows a third way via trade. Uh, Columbia is a wonderful company for, uh, for trade. They have great uh, agricultural products, mm -hmm. they have uh, wonderful manufacturing products that, uh, that they've developed over the years, and that trade builds the economy because now you're exporting uh, goods to other countries. The fourth way that grows, though, an economy is through consumption. And China is focusing their growth on consumption. They're in the second uh, year of their 12th five-year plan, and we saw this going back to, uh, to 1996 when we first entered China, where we knew that eventually consumption had to play a larger role in China's economy if they were going to thrive and build, uh, build, build prosperity for 1.3 billion people. Uh, and uh, that's really taking place right now because we're seeing China uh, take steps of moving from uh, consumption represents about 35 or 36 percent of total GDP yes. in China. Uh, contrast that with uh, countries like the United States. Uh, 69 percent of our economy is consumption driven. People go out and buy cars. People go out and buy clothes. Uh, food, the, air. Food, air, uh, uh, etc. The United Kingdom, 62 percent of their overall economy is from consumption. Your country, Colombia, 65 yeah. to 66 percent of GDP, gross domestic product, is consumption. Uh, Japan is 58 percent. Uh, South Korea is 52 percent. And now it's China's turn to understand we have to build up the consumption side of this economy. 
So that's taking place uh, right now in, in, in China in a very, very rapid fashion. Uh, when you get right to consumption in, uh, in a country like China, um, 35 years ago, uh, the Chinese consumer uh, basically had two Mao suits uh, that they wore on an ongoing basis. Uh, you go to China today, uh, particularly in their tier one and tier two and tier three cities, as I travel around there, uh, they look like the consumers in, uh, in Colombia, like the consumers in the United States. Mm -hmm. They have a wide variety of shoes. They eat uh, broader forms of food, uh, uh, samplings uh, and soft drinks that come from Japan, they come from Korea, they come, they're Chinese uh, beverages, but they are, they're European and South American and, uh, and North American uh, beverages as well. Um, that is helping stimulate their economy because when a consumption job is created, it creates more jobs. If I could give an analogy of uh, one particular industry. Yeah, uh, go ahead. The automotive industry in China. China, last year in 2012, uh, built and sold over 19 and a half million automobiles. That's the largest automotive manufacturing in the world. There's no bigger country. Last year, the United States sold 13.5 million cars. Uh, built built 13.5 million cars and, and, and made those, those types of sales. Uh, but that also in, includes uh, foreign uh, cars that, uh, that, were, that came into this particular market. When you build a car, uh, as China has done, they built it in a factory. The first thing that they did, Honda, for example, which is a Japanese company, yes. they have plants in China and they agreed to three consecutive years of 12% compensation increases every single year for three consecutive years. So they're raising the compensation of consumers. Incomes are going up. When consumers have more money in their pocket, whether they're in, in China, the United States, Colombia, discretionary spend expenditure takes place. And we go out and we spend things on food and shoes and uh, cosmetics, uh, our health care, automobiles, etc. Uh, so those become wins. But having more cars also creates another aspect for the economy. A car needs a road. Infrastructure gets built. Mm -hmm. A car needs fuel oil. So a, a, an oil company says, I'm going to build a service station, a gas station, uh, to service that. Uh, you drive down a highway in Colombia, uh, the United States, and now in China as well, you have to stop for, uh, for fuel. At the same time, there's a convenience store in there. And goodness gracious, right there in the middle of China is a KFC, a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yes, Kentucky Fried Chicken. That, that, uh, McDonald's. That is, uh, McDonald's. And they're sitting there, and then they created new jobs in those convenience stores. Convenience stores beyond that, you have car repairs, something that's going to take place in China in the course of the next 10 years, and it's a great opportunity for them, is they're going to create a used car or a pre-owned car market. Because just 10 years ago, China only built 1.5 million cars. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing 19 and a half million, three years in a row. Here in 2013, our studies that we have from our company indicate that they'll sell well over 20 million automobiles in China. And it all starts because somebody said, I want a car. Consumption helps grow the overall economy. Yeah, they went from bicycles to cars. Exactly. Uh, Roger, why did you think it happened in China? Who, 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 who was the, 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 the main, uh, how could I put it? Uh, hate or, you know. There, there's no getting around, uh, Carlos, the fact that there's a centralized government there. And the government was driving that. Uh, one of their prime ministers, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, yes. uh, back in 1987, uh, said we need to change our economy, we need to grow it uh, over stages. And started giving that guidance. And it was 
social, and in their words, socialism with a Chinese uh, uh, bent and yeah. practice. Let, um, me, let, me, let me tell you something. In 1987, I was told by the, uh, an owner of a Jap uh, Chinese restaurant that the Chinese government was paying them all over the world just to find out how the consumers were acting every, in every country. Mm -hmm. And those restaurants, because you know, restaurant Chinese food is all over the world. Absolutely. And it's been all over the world since I don't remember when. Right. And those owners were telling the government how the countries were doing and how consumers were working and were acting in everywhere in the world. Right. And that's, I, that's competitive in the intelligence. Right? <laughs> and at that time, I remembered, everybody said, Chinese? Oh, come on. They're not going to do anything. And nobody believed that they were doing that. That, that is a wonderful analogy, and I, and I agree with you. And they're taking that to other industries as well. Uh, the Chinese are fast innovators. Yes. Uh, they're fast imitators. Uh, they have an ability to say, let's take the best of an idea that we find elsewhere and put our stamp on it. Uh, they're doing that. Uh, they certainly did it in, uh, in technology. Uh, they did it in manufacturing uh, techniques. Um, and because their economy was growing so rapidly, now they've taken it to larger uh, industries as well. Um, if, uh, if we were driving around Beijing, uh, Shanghai, Wuhan, uh, Chongqing, uh, any number of about uh, uh, 168 uh, different cities in, uh, in China that have over a million population in each one of those cities, it's large vertical buildings that are going up. A large vertical building that goes up, what's it need? It needs an elevator. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it needs uh, a construction boom that goes over the top of that. 60% of all of the construction booms in the world are in China. That's created jobs and opportunities. Now, you're not going to say, let's manufacture that construction boom in, uh, in Europe and then transport it over to, uh, to China. You're going to build it right in China. Uh, and and that's, that's helped their economy as well. Some of that's tied to infrastructure because it might be an airport. But some of it's tied to consumption because somebody's saying, I've got a new apartment in that building that's going to be 40 stories, and I'm going to be moving in there. And it took a construction boom to be uh, uh, sitting up the top of the, uh, the building. Okay, Roger. We have to go to another commercial break, and we'll be right back, okay? okay. Vamos entonces a otra tanda de comerciales, y ya estamos de nuevo con ustedes. Uh, to, 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 in China, how did they uh, know their competitors? Because, to remember, some years ago, nobody liked Chinese products. Right. Right now, you know, if you go to any stores in the U.S. or all over the world, most products are made in China. How did they do that? I, I think one of the uh, a credit to their society is they really focused on education. Uh, and to their credit as well, they said, let's educate our males and our females. So they were, they were given that opportunity to get a high school degree, and then more and more of them went on to, uh, to college degrees as well. Uh, these people are uh, intelligent, very bright. Uh, they're great observers of what's going on about them. Uh, they want to learn. They have a natural curiosity about the world. Uh, and that's going to be a benefit to all of us. Colombia is going to see more and more uh, Chinese visitors. Yeah, uh, in, we in just signed years. a free trade agreement with China. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and and uh, uh, Colombia, fortunately, will be seen as a port of entry to, uh, to all of South America yeah. uh, by, uh, by Chinese uh, business people. Uh, and that will be a win. And they'll be encouraged by their, uh, their government to, uh, to do that uh, as well. Uh, the United States has uh, continued to expand uh, its trade with, uh, uh, with China. Uh, we have exports that are going to that country. At this particular point in time, it's largely agricultural in, uh, in nature. Uh, yeah, the U.S. has a lot of investment in right. China. Uh, major investment. Uh, our, our multinational companies that might be based here, 
uh, have investments in, uh, in, in that right. country. And we have a lot of uh, uh, small and mid-sized businesses that have moved operations into uh, to China as well. Um, I have a, a very close friend uh, that owns a, a, a good size manufacturing operation. Uh, they make valves. Uh, everything in the world takes a valve. Uh, now he's had uh, he has three three plants in the United States. He's in Romania. He has a plant in Italy. He's got two plants in China uh, because. If you're a power company, you have to have valves. If you're a water company, you have to have valves. So he's got intellectual capital in the develop and the design of, uh, of his, uh, his products, but now he can manufacture them right in, uh, in China as well. And China has really embraced this particular uh, manufacturer because he's got the best technology in the, uh, in the entire industry. The Chinese market is a market of opportunities. Uh, I just found out that Bimbo bread company from Mexico mm -hmm. is becoming number one in China. Yeah. Offering bread. Roger, what will you say is, it has been the most difficult thing in getting into the Chinese market? Language? Language can be a challenge. Uh, I'm too old of an individual to learn Mandarin for the very first time. I, I, I just <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I just started going to China five years ago. Uh, but it's a matter of building trust and uh, reliability. Uh, the first time you go to China, uh, there's somebody that told us but something might be interesting. You're right. home free. Well, it, you, you, they, they'll listen to you. They'll listen to you. The second time you go there and see them again, they say, maybe this person is real. The third time <laughs> that you go there, they'll say, well, let's sit down and really tell me what you're all about and what you have and how you can help me. Uh, the world over, human beings, being human beings, are going to say, I need trust, I need reliability. Uh, so it's, it's a time uh, factor. You know what we need? More time because we're running out of time <laughs> for this program. But we continue next week, okay? There you go. Okay, Roger, so we'll see you next week, okay? Very good. <laughs> vamos entonces a despedirnos por hoy, se nos acabó el tiempo, pero vamos a continuar hablando con Roger Saunders la próxima semana. Por el momento, muchísimas gracias y una feliz noche. whether we're in the automotive business or whether we're in, in the retail business. And the consumer has choice. Uh, more and more all around the world, we're finding that companies are recognizing the consumers at the center of the equation. So you have to start with that, uh, that center portion. Uh, you reminded me of Peter Drucker in the 1950s mm -hmm. because too many companies in the world don't recognize what their competition becomes. Uh, I mean, a competitive intelligence. You know, competitive intelligence is an opportunity to be able to understand your marketplace. It really comes back to core marketing uh, principles of understanding the consumer first, what it is that you're trying to accomplish, what products or services that you're trying to bring to them, uh, at what particular price, how often are they going to consume it, and understand uh, how that measures up compared to your competitor. We all have competitors, whether we're in the CPG business or Compet competitors are. Mm -hmm. And he used to say in the 50s that the, 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 the competition or the competitors that we're going to have are direct competitors, indirect competitors, mm -hmm. and invisible competitors. Mm -hmm. And when he said invisible competitors, he was, you know, he was uh, referring to the web, to the internet. Mm -hmm. You don't see your competition, but you have it. Right, right. And as you recall, Ted Levitt in the marketing myopia. La ciudad de Columbus en el estado de Ohio. Roger Saunders es uno de sus directivos, un hombre que conoce muchísimo sobre el mercado asiático y específicamente con la China y el efecto que han tenido los tratados de libre comercio, como decíamos antes. Por eso vamos a hablar con él sobre un mercadeo efectivo cuando hay tratados de libre comercio. Vamos a hacerlo en unos minutos cuando regresemos de comerciales. Ya volvemos. Good evening and welcome to my program. 
Thank you very much, Carlos, for having me. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, Roger, let me ask you, or let me start by asking you, what's a competitive advantage? Buenas noches, bienvenidos a la Serie Internacional de Tiempo de Mercadeo 2013. Yo soy Carlos Fernando Villa. GoProsper es una de las empresas más famosas de consultoría de mercadeo internacional que tiene sede en...